make one of my all-time favorite dishes, chicken scarpiello. I used to eat this constantly at this lovely restaurant on the Upper East Side with my friends, so it's very nostalgic for me. I've had different variations of it, and the variation that I do involves a boneless, skinless chicken thigh, my favorite, and I also incorporate sausage, which I think is kind of a fun thing. There are a lot of different flavor profiles in this, and really it's a very bright, tangy, lovely thing. So we're gonna start going, and we start out with our aforementioned chicken thighs. I have a pot right here, which is getting a little hot. You wanna have something with a little depth to it because we're gonna be adding stock and lemon juice. So here we go. Gonna get a little swirl, get that going. And then I'm gonna start adding my dredged thighs. Ooh, that's got some real heat to it. Perfect. All right, and this has been seasoned. My pet, my flour that I'm doing this with has been seasoned. Wow, that's hot, 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 hot. It's always exciting with cooking. You don't really ever know what you're gonna get sometimes. Okie doke. So anyway, I've seasoned this with salt and pepper. I'm gonna add a little bit more oil because I'm not gonna get any color at all with a dry pan. There we go. Perfect. All right. You wanna be careful when you're dredging things in flour like this but the pan isn't too hot because you don't want your flour to burn, which is happening a little bit here. I'm gonna add a little bit more oil. And we just want these to brown up. There we go. So it's not that much oil, it makes things shocking. I'm gonna put these pieces over here and rinse my hands really quickly. Got a lot of noise going on. All right, now we're gonna add in our sausage. And this is where my recipe varies from other recipes. And I have here is a sweet Italian sausage and a spicy. I am cutting them into thirds and adding them directly into our pot. Our pan, it's like a pot pan. So it's, you know, as I said before, I know it seems like I'm really going high on the oil. I'm just trying to bring down the temperature a little bit and make sure there's some fat in there for things to brown off on. All right, so again, we're cutting this into thirds. It's okay if it's not perfect, excellent. Excellent. And you just want to kind of tuck them in. You know, remember the more things that you introduce into a pan, it's going to bring the temperature down. All right, do my eye on this. And when I say this is just loaded flavor, it really is. Now listen, you don't have to do the spicy. I happen to like that heat. Oh, and FYI, that is really hot. All right, so that got a little brown. Fine, no problem as long as it's not black. And the other thing I'm gonna add in here too is garlic, but I'm not gonna mince it up. I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna use whole cloves of garlic with my very messy sausage knife. And I like using the whole cloves of garlic because when they cook, what happens is they get kind of melty and yummy. So here we have, perfect. We're gonna just pull this out of its little casing. Fantastic, and that goes, oops, you don't want to put the paper in there. That's one thing. So this recipe, again, for me, is incredibly nostalgic. I mean, we used to just share plates of this and, you know, drink wine and laugh and, you know, all those things that you do in your 20s and you're just kind of being ridiculous and fun and whatever you might be doing. Um, so I love this. It also has a lot of rosemary, and rosemary for me is a really preferred herb. I'm just looking to get some color on these little sausage bits. And as I mentioned, when, the more you add on to a pan, the heat's going to drop. So you always just want to be playing with the heat. You know, you really very rarely are just going to be, you know, stay flat. I mean, maybe if you're steaming something. Good. We're getting some more color in here. You know what I realized I forgot to add was some black pepper, which is fine. Because that just means, my friends, that we can add it right now. And as I said, you want to get your little garlic cloves in here. Oh, if you could smell this already. It's the garlic and the sausage and the chicken is browning up and it's just, it's heaven. I mean, it really is a very, very yummy profile. We're now going to, let me get my sausage off my board. Rinse my hands really quickly. Again, we always want to be careful about that. We keep our hands clean when we're cooking. Alrighty, so now the next thing we're going to add, put in here, I like to add the rosemary because, again, like herbs, you want them to get a little chance to toast up. I think that's, you know, really makes a big difference. And so here I am, I'm eyeballing this. I have to admit, I do that a lot of times. It's about a teaspoon. And what I'm going to do is look around, and 
It's going to vary because sometimes you're going to have chicken thighs which are bigger. You know, I think I would serve this. This is enough for four people, I think, generously. All right, the next thing that's going to go in here is the juice of one lemon, which may seem like a lot, but we really want this bright, bright flavor to get in here. Let's see if I can find a knife that I can use that is helpful. Here is my knives have run away from me. It's kind of stressful. All right, I'm going to use this one. Oh, found it. Perfect. All right. What we're going to do is we're going to add the juice of one lemon. Perfect. And I love using these things here because it really is going to make sure there aren't any seeds. And you don't want seeds. Just kind of evenly going around. I love lemon. If you want it even brighter, you could certainly add a lemon and a half. Go wild. Do whatever you want. Excellent. Yes, 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 yes. And then the other thing you can add in here if you want to kind of up the heat too is you can add in... Um, you can add in red pepper flakes. That's always super tasty. Now look, that lemon juice is trying to get up all those little bits. Heaven. I mean, I cannot begin to describe to you what it smells like. I know everyone says that. Like if you were here, you'd go crazy and all of that. We're going to add in our chicken stock. And we're going to be serving this because this sauce, as you can see, is going to be... It's about a, I put a cup of stock in. This is actually my homemade stock. It's 50-50, whether or not I'm making my own stock. But this week I have to make it, so I use homemade stock. And what I like to do is you sit here and you simmer it, and then you kind of keep an eye on it. And what I'll do throughout the cooking process is I'll flip it. All right, this is going to lead us into the next thing we're having. So we have all this, obviously, divine sauce. Perfect. Look, it's simmering up nicely. So we're going to want to have something that we can serve with it the sauce can go on to because that's a really big part like what's the point of making this gorgeous sauce if i don't know you're not going to actually get to enjoy the sauce it's going to be like a secondary so i am making a pepper and pepperoncini potato hash and what's really lovely about this i'm using one of my all-time favorite pans which is this massive cast iron cast iron is one of the best things you can have in your kitchen arsenal it's not expensive. It's forgiving. You can use it on a thousand different mediums. I was just talking with someone here how he cooks and uses it on the grill, which is brilliant. I mean, it really is this like fabulous thing. So and the other thing about it is, is it gets really hot and you get fabulous sears on it. So we're going to do our potato hash. And what I like about that, you know, a lot of us think of hashes as being a breakfast food. I personally am not a breakfast person, so I, but I love hash. So I'll do hashes with meats. Look at this. This is getting all bubbly and nice. And you just want to make sure it's not sticking. That's the one thing here, the one caveat. So we're going to do this potato hash. And one of the things I've realized over the years of making hashes is the best thing you can do for yourself is to pre-cook your potatoes. Because what happens is if you're trying to cook potatoes in a skillet like this, it's going to take forever and everything else is going to burn and you're you're going to be pretty unhappy i can certainly assure you of that all right so let's see what we're going to have over here so going into our potatoes hash is obviously these red potatoes that you can see that i've cooked already these are cooked through these are not par cooked these are cooked and i've cut them into smaller pieces because what we want is all these little surfaces to get brown and yummy and have that really you know that taste on it that yummy 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 taste I have onions over here. This is two. And I just wanted to show you the cooking, the cutting technique that I use. So I cut them in half. I went down the middle. Sorry, I'm blocking the camera. And then I slice this way. So I end up with these kind of, you know, long pieces instead of a dice. And the reason I like that is I love onion. I like the taste of it when it's browned up. So that pan's starting to get hot. My beautiful cast iron. This has got a really heavy simmer on it, which I like as you can see, all of it reducing. Now this guy right here is gonna get this fabulous coating. And again, a cast iron is, they're so well priced. It is, you'll have them forever. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt about that. We're also gonna add some red pepper. Here, we have got these guys here, trying to run away from me. All right. And what I'm gonna do with these guys is I'm actually gonna put them into a smaller dice because I don't want it to be big chewy chunks of pepper. Again, this is normally where my pug would be screaming at me for pepper, but since I'm here and he's not up here, I'm just going to put it to the side. 
And you can see here that I'm doing a little bit of a smaller dice. So it kind of goes, the onion's a bigger size than we have. We go down to the potato, and that's what we've got going on. All right, while I work on this, it's a good time to segue over to the tablescape that I worked on today, which is all about updating classics like we're doing here now. So I hope you enjoy that. So what do you do with that never ending set of China that was either a gift from perhaps your grandmother or your great great aunt or even your own mom? It comes in stacks and stacks and stacks and it's a little outdated and it's certainly frumpy looking and it's got a thousand pieces, which doesn't really align with our lifestyle today. I always shy away from overly matching pieces. I like to be eclectic. I like a different, I like contrast on my table, but today, it's a chance to really embrace the million pieces that come with it, but do it in a way that updates it and makes it so it's fun and usable and actually turn all those pieces that we're not quite sure what they're for into something pretty and different. I started out with my tablecloth, which is always for me the foundation of the table. And I realized that I couldn't really go with something super modern because it would just get a little too off kilter. So I went with something that's kind of whimsical and I think is really cute. And it's this berry covered tablecloth, which is kind of has a vintage vibe to it, but I like it and it's playful and it's not frumpy to me. The key to successfully using that kind of never ending amount of matchy matchy China is to use more modern pieces underneath. And the way that I went about that was I used this lovely shell charger, which is completely different than anything on the table. It also adds a little bit of shine and bright which is nice because sometimes I find that the older patterns, the flowers tend to be smaller and not as bold. So it's nice to have something on there that offers a bold background. And you can see from here, I'm gonna move these silver pieces. This certainly does it. It's this wonderful, beautiful, you know, mother of pearl look to it. It picks up the light and it's a great place to put our plate. And now we have our dinner plate, which is certainly one of these older patterns. And it has the smaller flowers and it has a very sweet pink and, you know, yellows and blues and all of this. But it definitely has a little bit of a dated look and a little on the overlay, like, at least in my case, it's highly feminine and seems a little frumpy. So let's update it. So we put this on this kind of more contemporary placemat. And this is where we go into it. We are going to use a matching salad plate or you can put whatever you want on here. This actually might be a fun chance to make some kind of like retro hors d'oeuvre and kind of do like an amuse-bouche or a selection of retro hors d'oeuvres on here. Like um, you could do devil on horseback and then like a little cheese quiche and then find a third thing and then actually use that as your appetizer. That would be super fun. So there we have, so we've now we have the match and match. It's still looking kind of fun and interesting. And then what I've done is I've taken a very kind of I think more contemporary napkin. It's certainly more of like a country vibe, but has the fringing. And I put this napkin ring on it, which has this very modern kind of beaded look to it. It's not overly contemporary, but it's definitely of today. And I want to note something else about the napkin rings. In order to make it less matchy-matchy, I made a point of using two different styles of napkin rings. You could certainly do more than that, but I feel like using different pieces that don't necessarily match as a more contemporary take. So I like how we do that. And it's breaking away from everything being exactly the same, which is what we don't really want. I have, but we want, we want to use those pieces, but we don't want it to be overwhelming. We want to breathe some fresh air into this table. We're using the same plate, this little adorable bread plate. So again, I'm always an advocate for bread. I think that's great. As far as the stemware, I went with a very contemporary wine glass. One of these giant kind of balloon glasses, which are so pretty. Um, they're, each glass is different, which again is playing with that more contemporary, relaxed kind of vibe about not everything having to be matchy-matchy. So I like that, that we have this very contemporary wine glass with this big balloon, non-matching pattern that's mixed in. Next to it, there's this very, oops, are we dinging? This very kind of like mod vibe green glass. I like the green in it because it picks up on the green that we see in the tablecloth as well as the green that we see in the plate. And they really work well. So it's complementary, although they're vastly different design styles and they're from very clearly different periods. So again, we're chipping away, no pun intended, at that very kind of like 
dowdy old school china. Your flatware is the perfect place to really give this china an update and fast forward into today. It has a very kind of thin handle and it has a nice Danish modern look to it with this very pretty pink and gold. And the gold actually picks up in the gold that you see in the design. And it's a nice little homage to the pink femininity of this pattern. So I really like how these work together, but this is clearly a very contemporary piece. We have a spoon for dessert. This is also another opportunity to kind of play with that retro vibe and do some kind of like ridiculous over the top old school dessert. I mean, it could be a Charlotte or some kind of re weird jello thing, whatever it is. You probably shouldn't say weird for dessert, but you know what I'm saying? It's your chance to really play with some old cookbooks and have fun there. I have taken all of these little pieces that we see that are kind of, you know, this lovely sweet covered butter dish, and you could certainly use it as a butter dish, but I'm using them as points of conversation on the table. Here we have this little sweet hot chocolate pitcher. And what's great about this is we're clearly not serving hot chocolate, but you can use it as a little decoration. And that's what the basis of our centerpiece is today, are all these sweet little pieces that come with these sets. Here's a little creamer. There is, what else do we have down there? We actually have a teapot, which is so sweet. Here's a sweet little teapot. And we're using these as our decorative pieces. And so we have this going down. I really have to share this. This is one of my personal favorites is this bell. I mean, I don't even know who would come if I rang a bell, bell in my house. Probably one of my dogs, hopefully. Maybe. We don't know. So these are all little talking points. I've also taken these really sweet cream of soup bowls with the handles right there and filled them with strawberries, which is part of the pattern that's on the tablecloth. What's nice about this is they're lovely and their color is gorgeous, but they're also wildly fragrant. So as your guests sit at this table, they're getting wafts of strawberry, which is really kind of a, who doesn't like a little waft of berry? Gosh, that's yummy. And they're edible. So encourage your guests to eat these during the table. Why not? We do have flowers on the table, but again, they're in a really beautiful and contemporary, here we go, contemporary vase. So we're trying to really bring this whole thing forward. And I think when you start realizing that you can incorporate these beautiful old pieces of China into a more contemporary and present day table setting, you're going to find yourself more likely to use it. And you'll actually start looking forward to using it and think about ways to incorporate it into your holidays and even perhaps into your more every day. All right, let's go back to cooking something delicious. Well, I hope you found that helpful. I know that I always like to add a little bit of a modern twist. So while you're watching this, I started the onions and the peppers, and this is for our potato hash. You can see over here that our chicken has really reduced. I've been flipping it just to kind of get it coated, and the sauce is really thick and beautifully. Part of the reason why you do that flour dredging is it comes, you know, comes back to pay dividends, as they say. And then this is what I was talking about before. You see these cloves of garlic? Look at that. They just mush, 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 and they, oh gosh, it's fantastic. And there's no reason to, you know, spend all this time mincing garlic because you just have to kind of hunt them down in here and then you mush them in. All right, so while that's going on, now what I'm gonna do is add in my potatoes. So again, I've cut them into a smaller dice and this is really important because that's how you're gonna get more surface space, right? That's what we want. I'm waiting until my onions are really have a good caramel color on them, which I think adds a load of flavor. And in we go. Now, this is a really important thing about when you're cooking with potatoes like this, is I did salt the water to cook them, but they need a lot of additional seasoning. I had not added in any salt to the onions or the peppers. So this is a good time to kind of get everyone happy. Make sure that those potatoes are not clinging to each other. So you see what I'm saying right there? You kind of want to make sure they're all broken up because otherwise you're not going to get that surface color. So we want those smaller pieces. We're looking at this. You're going to get the stuff that sticks in the bottom. It's totally fine. It's actually super nice. Okay. And now's a good time to season these. This is sitting here perfectly, which is really pretty. And look at this. I mean, the sauce is absolutely divine and loaded with lemon. My only thing I will point out is that is the top of the, look how soft that is. I mean, it's basically shredding. I mean, gosh, who does not want to eat this? Well, I guess a vegetarian, but you eat meat, 
you're down with this. And let's taste the seasoning. Taste this one, I'll taste that one. That's really good. I'm gonna go for a little more black pepper. That's very nice. And you know what? I think I might just do a little more lemon. I think a little end, like a little braid lemon. You know, and I, there we go. Just to kind of give it a little pop. I think that's kind of helpful. All right, now we're gonna go over here. Remember, when you're seasoning potatoes, you've gotta be generous. I know it looks like I'm turning them into a salt lick, but I'm not. All right. Now this is kind of a, you've gotta keep adding a little more fat to this. One thing I love to use that I, if I have floating around is I'll use duck fat to make these. I'm a big fan of that. All right, so we got these guys in here and they are doing their thing. Now look, everyone's starting to get a little brown on them. And again, if you had, hadn't far cooked your potatoes like this, the issue that you're gonna run into is that you just simply, they're not gonna cook in time. And it took me a very long time to have that revelation that it was so important. Now, again, I chose this as the side, and we wanna make sure this guy over here is staying warm and good. And if you have a cover, that would actually be perfect and ideal. I usually have one floating around. The key here is we've made this beautiful sauce, right? And we wanna make sure that that sauce is gonna get all over these potatoes. And this is definitely a dish where you're not gonna to wanna to nudge it incessantly, because you've also got something really fun that's about to go into it. Look how pretty that is. You know, one thing you could do with this as well, I mean, if you really were using this for more of like a breakfast thing, is that you could certainly put some eggs on here, you know, throw it in the oven really quickly and they could bake up. I've also done it with this hash too. Another really fun thing to do is to grate up a bunch of Swiss cheese and cheddar and put it on top and then throw it under the broiler. All right. Now we've got that kind of like font going on right there, which is all good flavor. I'm gonna let this sit for a second. And there's this one ingredient, which I think is amazing that I add to this, which is, it's our chicken that is all lemony and delightful and yummy. Um, this would be a nice moment. Actually, you know what else I could do here? I could hit it, although I'm using dried rosemary, you know, which is a little more of a crunch, but just to finish it off, if you had some fresh rosemary, rosemary is one of those herbs where a little goes a long way. So just keep that in mind. All righty. So this is, I can hear it. It's doing nice things over here. All right. Now this is where we're going to add in that extra little something. But we just want to make sure it's not burning. That's not burn. That's flavor. And this is one of the things that, again, about using a wonderful cast iron pot like this. I mean, it's just, they're insane. I mean, like this thing you will have forever. All right. This is the secret ingredient. You ready? So you can either use pepperoncini or banana peppers, and you've got to make sure that you get some of that brine in there. And what this is going to do is add this lovely bright taste. And I like to add it, ooh, gosh, I mean, that smells so good. I like to add it a little bit at the end, because that way, ooh, a little bit of that vinegar coming up. That way, um, it doesn't just kind of disappear. It stays as a bright thing. And the other thing I like about this dish is that I've added in, you need the red peppers and the potatoes and all of that. Let's take a little taste. I'm, you would be shocked at how much salt potatoes need. I mean, they really are not, this looks like we're doing good things here, right? They say we're doing God's work. Okay. Black pepper. And if you had some fresh thyme floating around in the back of your garden or something like that, or sometimes you have some extra herbs left over, I've even tossed in here, which is really tasty, is um, some arugula. Just if you kind of like, you know, those little bits that you have. Oh my gosh, now look at that. We're getting all that stuff underneath. This is really doing what it's supposed to do. All right, I'm gonna show you how to plate this. Now I kind of like this because I do think it's kind of an update on an old dish by adding the heat in much in the same way that the Scarpiello is getting a little bit of a twist and it's getting a little bit of an update with the sausage. And, you know, I think that's really nice and the extra garlic. So let's plate this up. And this is how I would plate it. I would, you can turn this off. And this is actually very forgiving too. I love forgiving dishes. You can make this ahead of time. 
and you can just heat it up. I mean, I will say that if we, I do have one of my daughters adores eggs. And if we have a leftover from dinner the night before, I serve us a lot with steak because it's just, why not? It's delicious. Um, she'll have it the next morning with breakfast. So it's very forgiving. It's easy. Ugh. And the smells that are going on here. And I'm, it's all from the, this pan. It's just fantastic the way it keeps going. All right. So this is how I'm going to serve it. I'm going to do it this way, which I think will be good. So we're going to do it on the bottom as a bed. There we go. Pull that off the heat. Perfect. Let that just kind of do its thing. Just remember, you never want to leave a metal utensil in your pot because it's going to conduct heat and you'll burn yourself. I can tell you this from experience. We're going to take one of these amazing thighs that we're going to put right over. Um, I'm going to go with a sweet and a hot. You know, you can always tell the difference. You can even do a couple, depending on how sausagey your friends are. Let's just not be shy. Let's go right in here. We're going to get all that extra sauce. One thing about cooking is you can guarantee you're going to get it all over yourself. And there we go. So to recap, we've kind of brightened up the classic. Here we can see on the camera right there how pretty that is. This is kind of a retro vibing plate. Is we've taken this classic um, Italian, oh, Italian dish that actually dates back to Calabria in like the 1800s. And we've added some modern updates. I love the addition of like the spicy peppers are in there. You know, you could also, if you wanted to, the pepperoncini that we added in here, or those are actually technically banana peppers, you could also add some into this. If you don't want the sausage or you don't like a spicy sausage, you could definitely take that out. I've also done it, instead of using sausage, I've done artichoke hearts, which are equally beautiful because I love the taste of lemon and artichokes just kind of go together naturally. I mean, I have to go back, to listen to this pan. This is how beautifully they keep their heat. I mean, how great is that? That's why... I mean, this would be really lovely, although I have said before, I'm not a breakfast person. This would be really lovely at a brunch because you could have it on the side table, not on a table, but you could have it on the stove and it keeps its heat and it's warm and beautiful and all of that. So we've incorporated these kind of like old fashioned dishes. You know, they've been around. I think we've all had these growing up and we've turned it into something more modern. And I like that about this. I like the fact that we can go back and visit these classics and turn them into something different and certainly give them our twists and put things onto what we like, introducing heat or flavors or any of that. Don't forget, cooking is all about having fun and exploring.